Praise the Lord. Now, I would like us to share from the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2. I will mention a number of verses, but because of time, I will begin reading from verse 23. Joel 2, from verse 23. It says, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Next verse. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, uh, uh, yes, my great army which I send among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Now, I want to use this portion of scripture to share with us this morning on uh, the Lord who restores, the Lord of restoration. I have been thinking, I've been praying, I've been asking myself questions, especially a time like this when uh, because of the things we have seen around us, many people begin to lose hope. And uh, the Lord led me to the life, or rather the times of the prophet Joel, because if you look at uh, the whole uh, book of Joel, because of time we can't read everything, but Joel was prophesying at a time when there was something in Israel, if I may just uh, uh, take you to to fast too, because you need to connect with something that he said there so that you link before we come to chapter 2. Fast 2, fast 1, uh, uh, sorry, chapter 1, fast 2, he had said this, hear this, you elders, and give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Now, from history, we know there was a uh, a devastating infusion of locusts in the land of Israel. And uh, because they say Joel and Amos and uh, some of the other prophets were almost in the same timeline, there were other natural disasters. And because they followed each other so quickly, by the time Joel is writing this prophetic word, he actually challenges the people to ask themselves whether they have ever seen anything like what they were seeing in their day. And he challenged them, you can even ask your fathers whether anything like this has ever come to pass in their days. Now, you just need to look around and you begin to realize the language used here is so much applicable to us in our day because, let's be honest, the things that are happening right now, we have not seen them ourselves, and if we use the language of uh, Joel, neither of our fathers. I mean, for the first time in my 47-something years in this world, I saw locusts, not just one, many. I mean, I had to park by the side of the road and take a short, uh, you know, video because I was seeing something I had never seen. And uh, my mother was telling me she has never seen locusts like what we have seen this year. Then while we were still wondering and musing about locusts, we had floods here in this nation, floods that were all over, uh, places that have never been known to experience flooding. There was a lot of flooding. Whole villages were submerged. While we were yet trying to recover from that, the corona thing came. And now, not only in Kenya, but all over the world, for the first time, 
is like the whole world, world grounded to a standstill. I mean, my own kids have been asking me, now what happens next year? Will we be now be forced to repeat a class? Of course, you know, because of the, 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 the change in the, 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 the academic uh, uh, calendar, now many of our kids, uh, as long as they were in school, they will miss a whole year. And uh, for many people, this is like a nightmare. We are at a time when, just like Joel saw, we are seeing something that has never happened before. We are experiencing something that has never been experienced. If, forget about many years, if the beginning of this year, anyone had told you, you, would, you will not be able to go to work, you, have, you would have said never. If someone had told you, you will not go to church, you would have said, this is not China. This, I mean, we are a free country. If someone had told you, you will not go to school, you would have said it has never been. I mean, we, have, we know school will, is always there. And it's like we were, in quotes, sure that some things will always be there. But then, all of a sudden, all those things were put on hold. The world changed as we knew it. We are now, you know, wearing masks in, in, in church. We are having to see it in a funny way. And at the end of the day, it's very easy for people to begin to lose hope. And the majority of people actually are at that point where they feel like what we have lost is so much, it can never be recovered. But let me tell you this. What we are experiencing in as much as for us it has never been, is not something new in the calendar of God's events. Because right here in this chapter of Joel, you are seeing the same, same language. People experiencing things they had never experienced. People going through things. Actually, he was telling uh, the, 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 the elders to uh, ask themselves whether they had, they had seen that, ask their fathers, and then he was telling them, Tell it to your uh, children and uh, their children to their to another generation because it would be a moment like uh, that has never been experienced, and that is exactly where we are now. If you go to chapter two, where I started reading, suddenly the prophet changes the language. He begins by the whole of chapter one. He is highlighting what was happening for them. It was a plague of locusts and. Uh, other things that were happening because if you now look at uh, Hosea, uh, 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 Joel, uh, Amos, and other prophets of the same time, there were other natural calamities that had befallen the land and everyone was at a loss. But now, suddenly, the prophet changes the language and begins to speak to the people of Zion and begins to tell them that they need to rejoice. Now take me back to, to verse 23, yeah that they need to begin to rejoice because the Lord was doing something. And uh, in a nutshell, if you look at that portion of scripture from 23 all the way to 27 where we have just read, what the Lord was uh, promising to do, in short, especially if you look at verse 25, he was saying that, give me verse 25, there is a language used there. He says, I will restore to you the years. The translation I'm using here says, and I will compensate, I will compensate for the years the locusts have eaten. Let me tell you this, because I believe this is now the message that Joel was speaking, and this should be the message for us at a time like this. We should, as a people who believe in God, as the children of Zion, just like he said, be in a position to believe God for a restoration of everything, Actually, the Bible here says the years. Let me speak this in a prophetic way. If you begin to look at the amount of time lost, now for us, the whole of this year is like it's gone and we are not sure if things will improve. But whatever happens, the promise from the Lord was he would compensate. That's the language used in this translation. This one uses the word restore. He would restore the years that the locusts have eaten. What I want you to understand is this. Instead of giving up, instead of thinking 
it's gone. We will never recover. We need to put our faith in a God who is able to compensate. I like this translation. Who is able to compensate for the years. Let me give you an example in scripture. And then I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to take you back here and show you how it would come about. When you look at the life of Israel in Egypt, they, if you like, they lost 400 years. Because from the time the Lord spoke to Abraham and told him your, your sons, your daughters will be slaves, there was a period of 400 years. Those are four centuries. I don't know how many generations you want to fit in there. Of a nation in quotes that is in exile, they have lost 400 years. Actually, if you go to now historical books, you... The language used, for example, when you compare Israel with the Edom, is there were kings ruling over Edom before Israel became a nation. Edom are the descendants of Esau. So, and you remember, even before they were born, these two men, Jacob, who is Israel, and Esau, they were strangling in their mother's womb. And the issue was this. They needed, the, the blessing needed to uh, to, to be given to one of them. So when you now look at their descendants a few years down the line, you look at the children of Esau and the children of Israel, well, now what became the kingdom of Edom, these guys have been a nation, a kingdom. The Edomites were a kingdom for many years. By that time, Israel was still they were still slaves in Egypt. I mean, the language used by the writer is there were kings in Edom before there was a king in Israel. So if you came maybe 200 years before Moses, you would, look, you would have looked at Edom and looked at Israel and uh, you would have been tempted to think the blessing of God is with Edom. Why? They are already a nation. Israel, we don't even know where they are. But after 400 years of uh, wasted time, in one night, the Bible says, the hand of the Lord drew, Egypt, uh, drew Israel out of Egypt. And uh, because they needed to accumulate the wealth that would take them uh, or enable them to rebuild their nation, the Bible says, on the night they left Egypt, God granted them so much favor with the Egyptians that the King James Bible says they plundered Egypt. What happened, if you can take it this way, is they had worked for free. They had been slaves for 400 years. But then God changed the, the situation in one night. And they were given enough gold and wealth to compensate for the 400 years that they had not been paid. And the Bible says when they left, they left with the wealth of Egypt. And we know the story. Apart from now, another 40 years that uh, they wasted in the wilderness, that was actually a waste because that, that, that was as a result of their, their unbelief. If you look at how God ordained, if they had followed God's instruction, 400 years in exile, they would have arrived in the land of Israel within the... the, the, the the commentators tell us that that journey would have taken 11 days, Egypt to Israel, if they had not uh, diverted into the wilderness. But even if they had taken a month or even one year, and then they would have settled in the land of Israel with all their wealth from Egypt, they would have, and then the Lord began to bless them so quickly because by the time we are talking of King David, Israel was such a great nation Edom and the other nations who had been nations before Israel were now uh, looking up to Israel. That's why by the time we talk about the, the third, if you like, the third uh, king of Israel, because we have uh, King Saul, then King David, and King Solomon. Nations of the world came from wherever they came from, including here in Africa, Ethiopia, the Queen of Sheba from Ethiopia, they went to consort with King Solomon. What does that tell you? Israel became, if you like, a superpower in just three, 
regimes, King Saul, King David, King Solomon. Other nations were now coming to consort with Israel. What you are seeing is a period when now God, because he wanted to restore to them the 400 years that they lost when other nations were already established. And that's why I use that example to show you when the Lord was telling Joel, I will restore the years, you can take that and look at it in, the, in a biblical way and begin to actually believe the Lord is able. And I want you to take this word as a prophetic word from the Lord that regardless of what you think has been lost the last few months, the Lord will compensate for the years, for the time that has been lost. Praise the name of the Lord. He is a God who restores. He did it for Israel. He promised it uh, through Joel. He is able to do it in our day. I refuse to listen to anything and anyone who looks at the scenario we have and begins to think that we have lost. You know, like <laughs> I saw something funny the other day. Someone was posting, I think when we were downloading 2020, it came with a virus. So we need to delete 2020 and, you know, uh, bring in another 2020. But listen to me. Virus or no virus, the Lord will restore. The Lord will compensate whatever has been lost. Praise the name of the Lord. Be it in terms of the, the economy, because when you listen to, you know, the, 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 the professionals in that, in that field who are telling us it will take very many years, well, that is them according to their calculation. But I believe in a God who is able to pay Israel 400 years in one night. He has not changed, and he can still do it for us. Whatever you think has been lost in the last few months, God, the Bible here says, I will compensate. I will restore whatever the enemy has lost. And I like to look at what the Bible says. I'm a firm believer in God, in what he says. When he says all things work together for good, I tell you the truth, that word cannot change. All things will work together for good for those who are called according to God's, you know, idea. Not, and, and, and I want now to take you back to uh, those who were being told to rejoice. Let me show you what, uh, what was the condition for that promise because many times when we read a prophetic word or a promise in the Bible, we forget there is always a condition attached. Everything God said will have a condition that I will do this and this, but then there is a condition. And if you look at now the whole book, because if you look at the whole book, that's where you get now what uh, uh, the conditions that the Lord was uh, placing upon them. Look at where we started reading. He's talking about the children of Zion. There is a reason why he said the children of Zion. Because he needed, and these are now the conditions so that we can walk into the conversation of the Lord. Number one, we need now to make our relationship with God personal. When we talk about children, we may be brothers... But I tell you the truth, the relationship between a child and the father is always a personal one. We are brothers, yes, it's uh, the whole family, but that relationship is so personal. You read the whole of chapter 2, you begin to hear the call that now the prophet was giving. He's saying now, return to me, that is chapter 2 from verse 12, He's, he begins to call people specific people. He says, gather the people for 16, assemble the elders, gather the children, the nurse, though even those who are nursing, let the bridegroom leave his room, that is for 16, let the bride her chamber, I mean, let the priest also leave their come, uh, leave their, 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 their allotted place and now come between the altar uh, and the porch. I mean, the call was for a personal, uh, or rather it was a personalized call. And one of the things, and I have been saying this and I will continue saying it, that this virus, or rather this pandemic is bringing out, is the fact that if you are going to make it to wherever now God wants to, to, to bring us to, 
you must come to that level where your relationship with God is personal. This thing of saying we, that's why he's talking about children of Zion. When he's talking about, uh, uh, you know, a, a family like that, it brings out the idea that I may have 101 brothers and I like something that my mother told me one time. You know, we were arguing as a family because, you know, when your mother begins to tell you you have not brought this and I begin to defend myself, why can't you ask my brother also? And she looked at me and told me, it is me who has many sons. You have one mother. So if you did not bring sugar to me, your mother never got any sugar. It is your, your brother's mother who got sugar. And of course, she won the battle. But of course, it taught me a lesson that when it comes to the relationship between a child and the father, it is never brothers and sisters. It is a personal thing. That's why he's talking about children of Zion. We need to come to that level where we think of our relationship with God at a personal level. It is good to be in a big church. And by the way, I want you to ask yourself this question. And these are things that we are beginning to really look at. With all the, in the former years, with all the hype of, uh, you know, 10,000 seater churches and things like that, in just a, how many months now? For four months. That has been reduced to nothing. I mean, <laughs> there's no difference now between a 10,000 seater and a 100 seater because even today we cannot be more than 100. So you begin to realize now those numbers begin to, they are not making a lot of sense now. You begin to realize that security we had in bragging we our church is uh, 10,000 people, it is no longer working because now you cannot gather together in the place of worship. It is now you, wherever you are, to begin to relate with God on, on a one-to-one -one basis. And of course, because many people were not, had not built their faith, you know, to that level, many have been shaken because the, the security they had in being in a group was taken away. When the Lord was saying through the prophet, call each one, the elders, the, even the bridegroom and the bride to leave their chamber. By the way, Israel was uh, established on the laws of Moses and uh, there was even a law governing someone who was just married. They were exempt from going to battle. They were exempt from many of the uh, communal things. But in this case, the prophet is telling them, leave your chamber. This is the time for you to come. He's not saying that couple come. He's actually saying let the bride, let the bridegroom. The call is so personal, even when it's a newlywed who are, you know, by the, when you are still calling them bride and bridegroom, they are probably in the honeymoon when they are wearing matching outfits, you know, the craze. But now, forget about that. Come alone, because now... The matter needs you to address at a personal level. That is how we are going to get this conversation that the Bible is talking about. The restoration is going to come because we have begun to build our personal faith. Number two, look at verse 13. Rend your heart and not your garment. We must make our faith deeper rather than just outward. I will explain what I mean. Israel, and this is something many of the prophets keep on uh, reminding them, because of uh, the outward expression of, faith, of their faith and things like that, they would fast, they would wear sackcloth, and when you want to express grief, you would tear your garments to show how sad you are and things like that. Listen to what the prophet is telling them. The times are unusual. There is something happening that we have never experienced before. And the prophet tells them, this time round, do not rent your garments. Rent your heart. He is talking about a deeper thing. And let me tell you this. 
in the midst of whatever is happening, we must make a deliberate choice to go deeper in the things of God. The outward things that we do, you know, the outward expressions of our faith, they are good, yes, but like, just like the prophet wanted them to realize, it doesn't help if you are just rending your garment, but your heart remains unmoved. If you are just, uh, uh, you know, wearing sackcloth, but then your heart is full of pride. All you are, do you remember, you know, I find it funny that when Jesus came here on earth and uh, he had a problem with the, with the, 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 the priest and the leadership, they, he kept on telling them that their faith was more on the outward things. They, he told them that they ignore the weightier matters of the law. They would ignore the, the deeper issues of their faith, but then they would emphasize on the outward, how you were washing your hands. You remember the quarrel between Jesus and the Pharisees is because the disciples ate without washing their hands, and not just washing their hands, not just sanitizing, they, there was a ritual way of doing it. That was a big issue for them. And uh, I find it comical that when they arrested him, remember the Bible says they took him to, to Pilate, but they could not enter the, the, the courtroom, if you like, because the Jewish faith was such that if you interact with the Gentiles, you will be defiled, you will be ceremonially unclean. And because that next day was a holiday, they didn't want to miss. Yet they were taking someone who is innocent, condemning him, and telling Pilate, crucify this man. I mean, they were ready to kill, but they were not ready to be seen in one room with a Gentile. Now, if you look at that, you begin to ask yourself, which is more sinful? Killing an innocent person, you know, accusing him falsely, or just going to the courtroom to accuse the person. But they would not actually pilot and to come out of the courtroom and address them from outside because they were measuring more on the outward things. Joel made this cry to the people, rend your heart and not your garment. Return to the Lord actually says, uh, return to the Lord for he is gracious and merciful. And then he says uh, in verse, uh, yeah, verse 12, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, all your heart. The issue here was they needed, and that is the same thing, we need to go deeper. Let your relationship with God shift from these uh, petty issues to the deeper issues of life. That is why he was saying, forget about your garment, rend your heart. Because at that particular moment to express grief, they would put on sackcloth, they would tear their garment, they would throw dust on their head. I mean, to show how miserable they are. But inside, the Lord looked beyond the garment and realized these guys are not even sorry. And that's why he was saying, rend your heart, and not your garment. If we are going to uh, receive the compensation, the restoration God is talking about, we need to go deeper in the things of the Lord. Let's stand on our feet. Just in a, in a few minutes, begin to encourage yourself that whatever the Lord is saying is a promise to you. You will recover. You will, uh, the Lord will compensate. Begin to desire, you know, that one-to-one -one relationship with God and to take your life deeper. Let's forget about the, the, the outward thing. The, and of course, you have realized in the last few months those outward things are no longer helping you because wherever you are, you are alone with God. You need, to, you need that deeper relationship with God. Yes, Lord. Open your mouth, begin to pray for yourself. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us. Just help us at a time like this. Father God, your promise is sure. You have promised us. Uh, we give you praise. We give you honor. Thank you, Lord. That we may go deeper. 
go deeper. That my life may go deeper in Jesus' name. Is Lord, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us you are a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us. Yes, Lord, you are perfect in all of your ways we believe it that you will compensate you will restore to us the years the months that the enemy has taken that this virus has taken you will restore to us in terms of catching up with everything in our lives you will restore to us everything that has been lost. You will compensate for the months. We believe it, we receive it. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Those of you who joined us online, the Lord bless you so much. The Lord keep you. Let your heart believe. The Lord is restoring. The Lord is compensating us for the lost years. Let's share the words of the grace together and now may the grace and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now. God bless you.